This morning, uh, I'm probably preaching to myself. Sometimes that happens, okay? When you're a pastor, you preach to yourself. Uh, last week, we had Mother's Day, and I shared a story uh, last Sunday about a woman in Scripture. Uh, she was a Canaanite woman, if you'll recall. And Jesus, what he's doing in that story was he kind of had retired or, or went away to relax. He went to a different region a Gentile region where he could be away from ministry. And this woman knew Jesus was there, and she had a problem. And that problem was her daughter was being possessed. We look at that story, we just talked about how she wasn't worried about Jesus being silent or the disciples trying to stop her, or the fact that she was a woman. Nothing was going to stop her from getting what she needed for her daughter. And there was something about that story that just continued to speak to my heart this week. There was something about this story that, that I just couldn't let go of. And it, it continued with me. And, and God just kept bringing it back and highlighting parts of it. And then, uh, as we were in men's Bible study, another thing came up. But when I thought of that woman, this verse in Romans chapter 12 just really resonated in my heart. It says, to be devoted to one another in love. Why was she pursuing Jesus Christ? Because of her love for her daughter, right? And then it says... Honor one another but herself. She wasn't worried about how humiliating it might be. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. We talked last week about a woman who definitely was not lacking in zeal. Her spiritual fervor was at an all-time high because she knew the answer to her daughter's Problem. Never be lacking in zeal. If there's anything that the Holy Spirit has been challenging my heart with this week, it's that phrase, never be lacking in zeal. You know, in the world we can think of some, some pretty interesting ways to define zeal, the things that will motivate us. When I was a kid, I remember watching TV in the basement with my parents. They'd sit on the couch and be down the floor and watch TV. And there was always this commercial that would come on, and it said, what would you do for a Klondike bar? You know what I'm talking about? Anyway, you don't know, watch it sometime. And they'd have adults on there, and, and, and Roy would be acting like a monkey, and Kathy would be quacking like a chicken, so she could have a Klondike bar. And I watched something this week because I was researching that. And I talk about zealousness. Talk about passion. Passion for ice cream. I'm willing to act like an idiot so I can have ice cream. Um, they had, there was a lady in 2018 is when this happened. She, she, uh, she had some expectant parents come in. And they had them sit in this boardroom. And she began to propose an offer to them. And her offer to them was, if you'll name your kid Klondike, We'll give you free contact bars for a, for a lifetime. What would you do for a contact bar? And you see these four couples, and they're talking, and some of them are like, are you serious? And this one couple, this one dude is engaged. He likes him on ice cream, you know? Like, can we name him that, but call him something else? Yeah, as long as his legal name is that. And then someone else comes up, and they say, what about a middle name? And they bring a lawyer into the room with these parents. And they say, what about a middle name? And the lady says, yeah, that's fine. And that dude that was already interested, he said, done. And they made the other people leave. And he was willing to name his child, give his child a little name, Klondike, for one box of Klondike bars a month for his child's life. When you talk about seeing You know, you turn the TV on a sporting event, you see some very zealous people. I mean, you got business people who will paint their faces and sit in a stadium of 55,000 street people. You got you got professionals who will put on like full Star Wars car. You know, with the Bengals, they got one dude that has an or orange stormtrooper suit that he wears to the Bengals game every week. You got dads that are screaming like fools. Zeal. 
There's a definition of that that says, zeal is truly great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. And the challenge that, that I've been wrestling through, the challenge that God has been speaking to me is, what are you passionate about? Like in your life, what is it that is the energy or enthusiasm that causes you to move forward? What is the objective or cause in your life that you are so zealous about? It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter what others might say. You're going to pursue it no matter what. And I, I struggle. And this morning, what God is speaking to my heart and what I, what I hope the, the Spirit in this room continues to communicate is truly a passion check for His people. Like, what are we really passionate about? You know, if I asked you that question and we weren't sitting in this room, what would you say? Like, what are you passionate about? Frisbees? Fishing? You know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. But truly, as I wrestle, I've been wrestling with this question this week. Like, what am I passionate about? My wife says, well, you're always passionate when you preach. Yeah, but, but beyond that, what am I truly passionate about? Like, what is it that I'm willing to use energy and enthusiasm to see it accomplished? I don't know if I had an answer. I don't know that I really had an answer to that question. And I think that's why as a pastor today, this sermon is so challenging. I want to look at Tam and say, hey, Pam, I'll take her out of the hospital, so I have to preach it. Because truly I believe God is, is, is looking for a passionate people. The scriptures are filled with people of passion. The verses we read, that's the same version of uh, the story we read last week. That was a lady who was truly passionate for God's promise. It didn't matter what stood in the way, that's what she had to have. Her zeal, her, her passion, her spiritual fervor was compelled by the promise of God. Challenge me, God. Men's Bible study, you know, because you can't get away when God starts speaking something. It's like a wife. Holy Spirit just keeps speaking. Pointing out all the different places that you should have heard the first time, but you didn't hear the first time, so here it is again. Some husbands aren't nodding yet. You can look away from your wife and nod. I know what I'm talking about anyway. Some Holy Spirit's made some more wise men in this room. We did Psalm 119. And I've talked about that Psalm, but Psalm 119 is the largest, longest chapter in, in the Bible, and there's the author of this Psalm is passionate about the Word of God. He's passionate about the promises of God. He's passionate about the law of God. Come on! When was the last time we said, well, I'm passionate about God's law? <coughs> I mean, this guy, he, he's so compelled by it. You were reading in, in Psalm 119, 1 verse 137, it says, You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal Where's me at? Passion, Jack. Dude is so passionate about the Word of God. My enemy, ignore your, your wisdom. His enthusiasm or energy for the Word of God literally wears him out is the word that he says. I'm so compelled by the truth that I'm hearing. I'm so compelled by the Word of God that I share it everywhere I go. And I'm worn out from sharing the, the Word of God. My zeal wears me out for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested. Your servant loves them. Go lowly in the spot. I don't forget your precepts. Your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me. Your commands, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes 
are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. There's a man with a passion for the Word of God. My zeal wears me out. I spent all night in the Word of God, coming up with promises. I spent all day studying the truths of the law and the precepts of God. It literally wears me out. When was the last time you said, I'm so worn out from my passion for the Word of God? Scripture is filled with passionate people. Mark chapter 2, a few days later, Jesus entered Capernaum. The people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such a large number there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they couldn't get to him, I'm going to tell you about some zealous living, some spiritual fervor. They knew where Jesus was. Their friend was paralyzed, so they're lifting his burden and they're carrying him. They come to the house. Since they couldn't get into Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat the man was lying on. They were so passionate about the presence of God. Crowd? We'll find a way around. Roof? Let's get a home. Mad owner? We'll deal with that later. Because Jesus is in the house. And I'm so passionate about the presence of Jesus. It doesn't matter what's in between me. I'm so passionate that I'm worried about who's looking at me in worship. I'm not worried about who I'm offending or who I'm going to upset. I know where Jesus is and I need to be there. Talk about a, a passion check. We know the story of, of Noah. I mean, here's something we all want to be passionate about. God spoke to him. Genesis 6. He gives him these orders about building an ark. Now I want you to think about Noah building an ark without a belt or an ark. Or hair brothers. This wasn't a short process. And there wasn't a radar that was predicting the storm. So I read 25 to 50 years. He's building this boat because God is upset with humanity. See, he's passionate about obedience. Christ, how many times have we started a project and we didn't last two weeks? But this, this man in Scripture, he's so passionate about obedience, it didn't matter if it was raining, it didn't matter how long it would take, it didn't matter that he'd have to cut trees down and mill wood or, or whatever he did to get the go for wood that he needed. It didn't matter if people looked at him and laughed. It didn't matter if he was afraid of snakes. God said it. And so it did. He didn't say, God, you know how long this is going to take. He didn't say, God, you know how far away the elephant truly is. I've only seen pictures of my magazine through on Facebook. No, I didn't say any of that. God told him to do it, so he got busy about what God told him to do. It wasn't about the results. It wasn't about the gratification. But he did it because God told him to. What are you passionate about? David in the, New Te in the Old Testament. He's rebuilt the temple and he's bringing the ark, the presence of God, back to the temple. And so David was so excited about that, he danced in his underwear. It's Pastor Steve's version. Linen and ephod, it says in Scripture. And Michael saw him from the window, and she couldn't believe what David was down there doing. 
She could not believe that the king would dance in his underwear before the Lord. And so when he came home, David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me the ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. You think dancing in my skivvies is bad. What do you see what's coming? And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by the slave you spoke of, I will be held in honor. You see, David was passionate about praise. It's what compelled him. It's what drove him. It's what he was zealous about. You know what? He saw the presence of God being restored in the temple of God. And he couldn't help himself but dance. He wrote most of the songs that we read because he was a man after God's own heart. His passion was truly praise. We know the story uh, of David. There's another story in the Old Testament about a high priest. His name is Jehovah. And Jehovah was a high priest in the kingdom of Judah. And he's serving in a weird time. There's a king who reigns for one year he dies. And because he dies, guess what his mom wants to do? She wants to be the queen. Now there's been a season of uh, bad kings in Israel. There's been a season of bad royalty, whatever you want to say. And so this woman, she's a queen now. She wants to become queen. So in order to, for that to happen, she has to make sure all the king's kids are dead. Right? Her son. That would be her grandkids. Come on now. And so she sets out to kill all his grandkids. Well, well Jehovah and his wife find a two-year-old boy that's a, a grandkid or the kid of the king, grandkid of the queen, and they keep him in a temple for five years. Now you want to talk about zealous living? Come have my kids for five minutes. <laughs>
to take that to other people. Man, I read these stories. And I ask a question. What's your passion? Like, what are you passionate about? Are you passionate about the promise, the presence? Are you passionate about the word or the worship? You know, earlier this year I preached on a verse of Matthew chapter 24, and in that verse it says, you yeah, have the love of growth, the love of homes will grow cold. And you know, really, I wonder if if we were to truly define, let's just say ourselves, let's not talk about anybody else this morning. Would I be more complacent than passionate? Would I be more pacified than jealous? Or zealous? Would I be more stagnant than stirred for the things of God? You know, it said because in the last days well, there'll be so many evil things around us that the love of most, that's what it says, will grow cold. And as a pastor, I'm compelled by that reality, the reality we're living in, where the love of most has grown cold. Like there's still an ember in there, but you're not going to get warmed by that fire. You know, I spoke the word. I was zealous like the psalmist and people didn't listen. And so I, I just gave up. I tried to get into the presence of Jesus Christ, but there were two rooms. I mean, I went to the top floor, but then there was no one. People told me to stop. People told me his promises weren't true. And I just decided that their words were greater than his, and I stopped seeking. You know what? God is love, so it doesn't really matter if people hear the truth or not, because a loving God won't send anyone to hell. We convince ourselves for all the reasons we don't have to do what God has spoken to us to do. What's your passion? What are you zealous about? Second Corinthians chapter 5. So since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. And we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. For we, if we are out of the mind, that we sense. As some said, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. Why? Because verse, verse 14, I really feel like this is what we need to focus upon this morning. I really feel like this is where it all begins. For the love, or Christ's love, truly compels us. Sometimes I don't get the passion because we don't believe that. Sometimes I don't think we're passionate because we haven't experienced that love. Sometimes I don't think we're compassionate because, hey, remember what, what it was when, when you first experienced the love of Christ and you were willing to tell anyone about him, but then you went down this road and, and people rejected you and they said stuff and you're not where you once were. You were excited and energetic and you knew what it meant to be a new creation. You knew the effect of sin in your life. You knew what you had been set free from and no one could convince you otherwise. But man, you've gotten way far away from that. You're more seasoned now. You're more dignified than this. You're not more undignified than this. And you've gotten to that place where everything thing is just okay. I need his love to compel me. Paul said for the love of Christ compels us because we're convinced it's that that's up here. Huh? How many knows there's a big gap sometimes from here to here? And I felt his love, but then I become convinced that it's not true. He said, no, we are convinced that one died for all. Who was that one that died for all? That Jesus died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who should, who should who live 
should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ as when we do so no longer. See, there's love, and I want to experience that love. And because of the love of Christ, I need to be convinced. Some of us need to be convinced. We need to make a head connection to what our heart is speaking. Some, when we've got the heart, maybe we don't have the heart. We need the, the heart connection, but it's going to come through our heart and our mind. Is it true? Are God's promises are true? Is God present? Are broken people in need of the love of God? Is sin holding people in bondage they shouldn't be held in? Is heaven and hell true realities that, that we believe in? Are we convinced in our mind? And I want Christ's love to compel me. I want to be compelled by the love of Christ Timothy says, for this reason, I remind you to what? Fan the flame of the gift of God. Yeah. So you just need some fan. That the one we're still into, you just need someone to fan that thing. Fan the flame for the gift of God. Sorry. Which is for you through the land of my hand, for the Spirit of God does not make us. But the Spirit of God, He gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That's zealous living. That's spiritual fervor. It's the gift of God. He hasn't called us to be timid. He hasn't called us to be afraid. But He's called us to be a passionate, zealous people. Now, I'm not talking about getting all crazy and being zealous in yourself. But being zealous for the promises of God. I need a passion, Jack. You guys think I'm old. <clears throat> Love, Dave, just so I can get my brain ready for the close of my sermon. I can't wait to the next one. Holy Spirit's been with me all week. What are you passionate about? I'm asking you that question this morning. What compels you? If you don't know the answer, and one of them needs to ask your spouse. As your friends, as your co-workers, you know what truly compels you? Where do you see me get energized and enthusiastic? I don't think we're all called to be compelled or zealous about the same things. I think God has created you how he created you, and he's given you this season, this moment, to be passionate about some peace of God, some promise of God, some presence of God, some work of God, some opportunity to rejoice or testify in what God has done, some life around you that needs to know the love of God, someone that is allowing themselves to be led down the path to destruction that God has placed in your life.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son.
people of passion. That we would be a people with zeal. A people with spiritual fervor because of the love of Christ compelling us. Speak to us about those things that we need to be passionate about. God, show us those areas we need to press in. Maybe it's the presence. Maybe it's the promise. Maybe it's the restoration of your will. Maybe it's the pursuit of God. Maybe it's, it's, it's all these things, God. The Word of God that brings life. The Word of God that is our needle that helps us in every situation. That is the bread of life. Let us be defined. Let us be known for our passion, for our zeal in Jesus' name. As well, Gary, this is in the song, I open the altars. If you want to pray about this message, if you want someone to stand with you and, and pray with you for the love of God, you can hold out your life. If you know someone that needs the presence and power of God in their life, if you've got a situation or circumstance, or you're waiting to hear, or you're needing the presence or hand of God. As a pastor, I desire to be able to pray with you and agree with you in these moments. And He's created you for an incredible purpose. It's a purpose that doesn't just affect you, but affects the kingdom of God. It affects our community. It affects where we are. Be passionate about experiencing all that He has. The Lord bless you keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. And may you be compelled by the love of God. Amen? Amen. Be blessed.